Hi, Danny. Thanks Hi. so much for coming across from Boston to join us here in London for the first of the essential interviews. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. You're very welcome. So let me start with, uh, with what seems very, very obvious and very clear, which is e-commerce is where all of the action is in, mm -hmm. in, in sales and, uh, and retail. And um, you know, with, with Clavis and, and One Click Retail, you're helping a lot of customers mm -hmm. navigate that. And uh, you, you have a particular tool, I understand, on, on how you're helping them do that. That's right. Uh, when it comes to looking at the digital shelf, there's a potentially a tremendous amount of data and, and insight available. And what we've done is created a framework to help brands better manage and understand the digital shelf. We call it Six P's E-commerce mm -hmm. Intelligence. Yeah. And it's built off the familiar Four P's framework of product, place, price, and promotion. We add page content and performance to create the fifth and sixth P. And across those six P's, you then have the framework to better understand what needs to be done at the digital shelf, how to prioritize actions, and where you're having the most impact. Right, right, OK. And uh, can you explain exactly what the digital shelf is for me? Sure. So digital shelf is the digital equivalent of what we see in brick and mortar. So at brick mm -hmm. and mortar, you stand in front of a shelf set. Typically, it's four feet. Uh, and you know, top to bottom, left to right, there's a certain way it's been merchandised. Yeah. That experience online is quite different. Mm -hmm. um, you'll go to the retailer site. You might do search. Uh, or you might use the navigation to find your way through, and then ultimately you're looking at a product detail page where you're making the decision on whether or not to purchase in most cases. So that visualization is what we refer to as the digital shelf. It's the image of the product, it's the title, features, description, and all the other information that goes into driving product information on that page. So, so after what, 100 odd years of selling in physical environments, that environment it seems extremely different and, and cr must throw up an awful lot of new challenges for, for, for CPGs and anyone tr seeking to sell through e-commerce. It does, it does. And, and the root of that, that disruption or that difference in the experience of brick and mortar versus digital shelf is really in two places. Mm -hmm. One is the fact that what I just mentioned, the four foot shelf versus one item at a time. Yeah. Um, and the other is historically brands have al always been responsible for uh, the marketing teams determining what goes on the package. Right. Now the e-commerce teams are responsible for taking what's on the package and getting it onto the retailer sites, um, which has a lot more complexity and requires a lot more digital savvy mm -hmm. to know how to translate into the digital environment, into the e-commerce environment, and make their brands as impactful online as they have been at shelf and store. Right, right. So, so Clavis is really making that visible for customers right. so they can really see what's happening. Yeah. Um, and then how do you help them perform better in that environment. Exactly. Clavis was the in innovator in the space. We were the first ones to essentially define how to measure the digital shelf. Mm -hmm. And we started with some basic measures like, are you in stock? What's your search rank? How many reviews do you have? What's your average rating? Pricing, and so on. Right. Um, and we also have a range of metrics around content accuracy and content compliance. Um, and those have become the critical elements for how brands need to understand how they're performing online. So you're processing an enormous amount of data with that? We are, we are. And that's really one of the key things to know about Clavis is given the number of brands that we have globally and the scale at which we're j harvesting, capturing data and um, quality checking it, what we call three layers deep to make sure that it is right. accurate at scale um, is really critical and, and, and core to our operation. Mm -hmm. So uh, my understanding is, is that you and OCR, Clavis and OCR, One Click Retail are, mm -hmm. Are, are looking to move to cover all of TCOM? Yes. And, uh, what is TCOM? How do you define that? Sure. So just to take one step back, one click mm -hmm. retail has historically been focused on Amazon mm -hmm. and measuring sales and share, um, and within that traffic and conversion, which are components of sales and share. Mm -hmm. um, with the creation of TCOM, which stands for total e-commerce, right. that sales and share projection model is being extended to more retailers, first for the US, then for the UK and other markets. Mm -hmm. These very sophisticated algorithms that One Click Retail has evolved over four or five years mm -hmm. are now being applied to the rest of online retail, so we can now start to report similar metrics for the rest of these retailers. Now, the rest of retail, including Amazon, is where Clavis has historically been, so you can immediately start to see the beautiful marriage here, which is yeah. now it's not just mm. Amazon sales and share plus Amazon digital shelf, it's now many more retailers TCOM, digital shelf, plus sales and shares, so we start to get to cause and effect. Mm -hmm. So are we beginning to get to a place where this is a navigable world, where there's, you, know, you, can, you can track this stuff, yep. you can work with you guys, see how you can optimize it. 
What, what, what do you think are the, are the next challenges that CPGs particularly are, are facing and they're talking about as they mm -hmm. get to grips with that? Yeah, the biggest challenge brands are facing online is what's referred to as digital native brands. Right. Um, that's probably the biggest external challenge that they're facing. The legacy competitors that they know uh, well from brick and mortar are not who are giving them a hard time online. Oh, right. Um, and so these smaller, more nimble brands are winning in search. They're winning on ratings and reviews. Their, play their playbook is a lot more nimble mm -hmm. than big CPGs to typically, or even big manufacturers outside of CPG as well, are typically used to playing by. Um, and so they need much more nimble tools, much faster analytics, and uh, ways to be able to respond as quickly as they can, mm -hmm. but at the scale at which they play, which is generally far more listings, far more retailers. And, w and what does that mean for brand in that environment? You imply that the, some of these smaller operators mm -hmm. are maybe not as brand powerful and are getting there quicker. Yeah. But w w how is brand in this environment? I mean, in voice, presumably brand is going to be super important, yeah. but how do you see this evolving? Yeah, part of the... Um, what gives the, the, the smaller brands a lot of credibility is around ratings and reviews and mm -hmm. how you turn up in search. Um, and so between those two, you might have a brand that you've never heard of at an equal weighting with a national brand that you've known and loved for all of your life. Um, and so that, you know, that does give those brands challenges um, and gives shoppers uh, an opportunity to try a product they might not have other otherwise tried. So what the larger brands are focused very much on our their equity, their branding, and making sure that they take the full power of what they know about the consumer um, and making sure that their proposition is very clear and they continue to win online as they have for years offline. Oh, and in China, we see a lot of e-commerce now through social media platforms. Yes. Do you, do you, we haven't really seen that very much yeah. in the West. Do you think we're on the brink of that, or what are the stop, What yeah. are the blockers to that currently? Do you yeah, think? it's it's been more difficult in the West for that to take on. The likes of Twitter and Facebook and other platforms have attempted to build e-commerce platforms, but haven't uh, had the same success as we're seeing out of China. Mm -hmm. Part of it is that uh, just by its nature in Asia and in China, in particular, it's a, just a much more um, communal environment, a much more social environment, and much more likely to be able to influence each other. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I think in the West we're a little bit more particular and a little bit more self-centric, if you will, um, and it becomes a little bit more difficult to definitely take the recommendation of a friend at face value and just say, I'm going to go purchase. Right. But we are seeing a lot of experimentation, and mm -hmm. it is inevitable that eventually we will start to see some successes in the West. You see that as inevitable, that that will happen? I do, yeah. Right. I mean, the power of a friend or somebody trusted, mm -hmm. their voice it means so much more. So go back for a minute to digital native brands. Right now I see search rank and I see ratings and reviews. Mm -hmm. But if I've never heard of this brand, I'm like, mm, should I try it? Yeah. But if I hear from a friend or somebody who's trusted, no, I tried it, it's not good. Or mm -hmm. yes, it's the best thing ever, you have to try this that's much more likely to have influence over that purchase. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of motivation for brands and retailers to figure out how to get that social influence into the purchase decision. Fascinating. And, and are there um, l legacy brands or uh, high b heritage brands that you feel that are navigating this new world well? comes from a wide range. So there's mm -hmm. some of the larger players like a Procter & Gamble and a Unilever who've been in the space for a long time. Yeah. They really have very established models around how to win in e-commerce. Um, and they're doing a range of making sure that their heritage brands or their larger brands continue to win and be strong in equity. But they're also doing innovative things like uh, acquiring Dollar Shave Club like, uh, right. like uh, Unilever did. Mm -hmm. P&G's made some similar acquisitions of these smaller, what were originally digital native brands mm -hmm. to help accelerate and propel them in. To wrap up now with a last question, what, what, do, you, what do you think the, the big things that um, are, are happening o over the next 12 months? What do you think are, are the big issues that people are focusing on? Is it still adapting to this environment or is there something else about to come through that, that yeah. people are going to have to deal with? In America, the big trend, the big dynamic right now affecting everything is the shift to e-commerce grocery through click and collect. Mm -hmm. um, where Europe's been there, particularly France and the UK, with the drive model and with click and collect, it's taken some time for America to catch up to it. It's having a massive disruptive effect on the market. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, I the acquisition of Whole Foods by Amazon is probably yep. the best depiction of that dynamic. But then you have Walmart responding, Target, every other retailer has gotten truly serious about how they're going to win in e-commerce. Um, with grocery, whether it's delivery or whether it's click and collect. So that trend and how brands adapt to it 
is uh, is what's really probably the main topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. There's revenue that's shifting from brick and mortar channels into e-commerce. Brands need to be able to respond to that, um, and they need to make sure that they've optimized their strategy and how they go to market to reflect those changing dynamics. Great, Danny. I could talk to you all day. It's super <laughs> fascinating. Thank you very much. Sure Cheers. Thing. Thank, Thank you. you.